Ah, the brave little toaster. This one's actually been recommended to me a few times in the comments section. People saying that despite its initial appearance, this is actually a pretty dark film with some disturbing scenes thrown in. Somehow though, I never managed to see this film as a kid, and it was only until people recently started mentioning it in the comment section did I actually decide to check it out for myself. So unlike many others, I'll be approaching this film with a fresh mindset, with no nostalgic attachment. Will the film live up to its high praised reputation, or is it just another case of nostalgia goggles blinding viewers to its flaws? Let's find out. Oh and uh, spoilers ahead. The Brave Little Toaster is an animated film released in 1987. The story focuses on a set of household appliances who are waiting for their human master to return home. The human master in question is actually just a small child, who the appliances have grown fond of due to the interaction they had with him over the years. Several years pass with no signs of the master or his family returning to the cottage, so the appliances decide to set out towards the big city in order to find the master themselves. Now if you're starting to think that this plot sounds pretty similar to another set of certain films, you know, inanimate objects coming to life which are used by a child character, coming separated from that child character and making it their mission to reunite with the child character as they believe that the child character needs them and they need him, yeah, sound familiar? Well, we'll get back to this point later on, but for now, let's take a closer look at the characters themselves. First up, you have a vacuum cleaner named Kirby, who's your typical old, grumpy, I don't need any friends kind of guy. In contrast to him, you have the electric blanket named Blanky, who has a very young and innocent persona, showing attachment to near anyone, which I guess his nature of being a blanket would suggest. Then we have the radio, which is one of the more unique characters. Unlike the other appliances, the radio doesn't have a proper face and so can't display emotion through facial expression. But to make up for this, he does have a very energetic voice, which is played in the style of a traditional sports commentator, even often narrating situations as if they were some great sporting event. Whoa, listen to this. It's the top of the ninth. The bases are loaded and Pee Wee races at the plate. There's the pitch and he connects. Oh, and it's a triple play. Then you have the lamp named Lampy who is the cynical and, no pun intended, the not very bright member of the team. And finally, the toaster, who is the all-round good guy who is also the leader of the group, understanding everyone's strengths and weaknesses and using that knowledge to help them on their journey. As well as their personality differences, the film also uses their unique appliance abilities for the journey, which is a nice touch. The radio uses his antenna to locate the city, the lamp uses his light to guide the way, the blanket providing shelter, the vacuum clearing the path, and the toaster… well, he's the leader. It's also nice to see how these characters evolve to become better friends over the course of the film. One moment in particular is early on in the film is when the blanket wishes to cuddle up with someone in the night, but sadly all of the other appliances reject him, even the toaster. But later in the film, there's a scene where a lone flower takes a shine to the toaster as it sees another flower in the toaster's reflection. The toaster basically tells the flower to do one and runs away. But he then looks back and sees the lone flower now drooping and dying. The scene in itself seems oddly sad, especially seen as how it was only a flower, but it has relevance as the toaster then sees what loneliness can do to someone and so from then on in, makes a conscious effort to be nicer to the blanket with even the lamp looking confused as to why the toaster is suddenly being so nice to him. There's another interesting moment where all of the appliances are hanging over a waterfall, with all of them except the vacuum cleaner falling to their presumed deaths, after which the music goes completely silent and we're given a long still shot of the vacuum cleaner just sitting there by himself. I don't know why, but that scene just seemed particularly powerful. The vacuum who used to be the independent lone wolf persona is suddenly faced with the reality 
that the only friends he has had have suddenly gone. This is the point where I believe many other films would add overly dramatic music to show the audience that this is sad and we must be feeling very sad right now. But leaving it silent gives you raw mixed feelings. The silence gives the moment more intensity and realism. It helps emphasize the sudden emptiness the character on screen is now feeling. And when the vacuum slowly starts to move off screen, I generally wasn't sure if he was just gonna leave them to their fate. Subtle scenes like this is really what makes the film shine in places. Then there are the not so subtle scenes, the scenes that everyone seems to remember or has at least heard about despite not seeing the film. I noticed whilst watching the film on how the tone will suddenly shift, sometimes even mid scene, where all of a sudden we get these really dark and creepy moments, like where the toaster is having a nightmare and out of nowhere this terrifying clown suddenly appears. Or that scene where a blender gets pulled apart. The whole section is playing out like a horror film. The eerie music, the fact that we never see what's actually happening, only the shadow silhouette and the character's reactions to it. It generally feels like he's ripping the heart out of some poor living creature. But probably the most famous scene of all, which even I heard about despite never seeing this film, is the scene in the scrapyard where the cars are getting crushed alive. Yeah, we see a bunch of scrap cars singing about what they were like in their prime and how they're now useless and must accept death as their fate. The fact that we also see the cars getting physically crushed in their final moments, it's pretty freaking dark. Also I noticed on reviewing, this car doesn't even wait for the magnet, he just drives on the conveyor belt himself. He just effectively committed car suicide. Huh. Though despite this scene's incredibly dark tone, you've got to admit, that tune is pretty catchy. Don't have the heart to live in the fast lane, all that is past and gone. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. Now I'm going to talk about a couple of negatives I had with the film. First point is that the film takes a little while to get going. Especially with that random scene with all the animals by the pond singing away, it didn't really fit the tone for the rest of the film and could quite honestly be removed without affecting the rest of the film itself. Secondly, I felt the sacrifice the toaster made towards the end was heavily underplayed. Don't get me wrong, the build up to it was absolutely immense and I was on the edge of my seat. Plus seeing him get mangled up like that in the gears was pretty gruesome. But literally within the space of 30 seconds, he's completely repaired and back to normal. I thought a film like this with its eerily dark tone and emphasis on friendship would have really been able to make an emotional scene out of this. Like at least have a moment with the other appliances gathered round mourning their friend, even have it play out like the silent scene I mentioned earlier with the vacuum cleaner. That could have been some hard hitting emotion right there. I mean, come on, if you're able to make me feel bad for a flower, I'm sure the writers would have no trouble making me tear up over a toaster. But no, instead we cut to a scene back at the flat where the master has somehow fixed the toaster and everything is immediately back to normal. My final negative is that overall, the film's plot does have a weak narrative to it. I mentioned how this film shares a similar theme to Toy Story. However, in Toy Story, the idea of a kid feeling attached to his toys, even in his later years, has a far more believable and relatable feel to it, rather than a kid getting overly sentimental about some household appliances. Especially appliances such as a toaster and a vacuum cleaner. And in that same sense, it doesn't really make much sense as to why those appliances are attached to the child and refer to him as the master. Yeah. The blanket, lamp and radio make sense, as the child was their primary user, but wouldn't the toaster and vacuum be primarily used by the adults of the family, and so they should view them as the masters? 
Speaking of the plot though, remember when I earlier mentioned that the similarities between this film and Toy Story were no coincidence? Well, that's because part of the film's development team consisted of the original members of Pixar Studios, including John Lasseter himself, the co-creator of Pixar, the same people who would later go on to develop the Toy Story film series. Funny enough, John Lasseter pitched the idea to Disney to have the Brave Little Toaster utilize computer animation, but due to 3D animation still being in its infancy, it was costing far too much and so the decision was made to have the film animated in full traditional 2D. Oh, how times have changed now. Shortly after this decision was made, John Lasseter received a call from the Disney executives informing him that he would now be dismissed from the project, so John Lasseter and his crew left Disney to go work for Lucasfilms instead. The film was then shelved for a couple of years before being handed over to Hyperion Pictures who were now having to work with a much smaller budget of just under 6 million, which is a third of its original budget. Further to that, Jerry Lees, the film's director, later on mentioned that external forces were making the decision to have the film produced abroad and just have it released as a cheap flick for a quick cash grab, which the staff actually rejected and were willing to make sacrifices on their behalf in order to give the film its maximum potential quality despite the slashed budget, determined to make something they could be proud of, rather than simply producing just another kids film. That is something you've really got to respect out of the people who made this film, and their effort really shows. Despite the seemingly weak narrative of the film, they really make the best with what they're given. There was even around 20 to 30 minutes of material cut, as the producers wanted the film to fit inside a 90 minute runtime. It would have actually been really interesting to see how this film could have looked if it had been given its full potential. But I think considering how much this film had gone against it, the people did a fantastic job with trying to make it work. And so, I'd recommend giving this one a watch. It's not going to blow you away or anything, but it will certainly be an enjoyable viewing for all ages with golden moments sprinkled in. And one thing's for sure, you'll never look at a scrapyard the same again. Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to watch this video. Please leave a like if you enjoyed what you saw and comment below what you thought of The Brave Little Toaster and any particular films or TV shows you want me to review in the future. My name is Steve Simpson and until the next one, take care.